You might go to law school thinking you want to do one type of thing, but you don't really know what you don't know. So for example, me in particular, I thought I wanted to do entertainment, but as I learned more about the laws, I had experience in entertainment, I really, I didn't know what else I wanted to do. Hi everyone, this is Jesus from Low Code, and today in Low Code's podcast, we have Haley Liviashvili. She is the founder of Geek Law. Uh, Haley, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you and Geek Law? Of course. Thank you so much for having me in the first place. And uh, yeah, so as you mentioned, my name is Haley Liviashvili. I am from New York originally. Went to USC in the U.S. in California for undergrad, and then I went to law school back in New York City. And while I was in law school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my law degree. I thought I wanted to do entertainment. And so I went to Warner Brothers and then I went to an entertainment oh. law firm. But I, while I was there, I kind of realized, OK, what if I don't necessarily want to do entertainment? What if there's another part of the law that I want to do? And I felt that my law school education wasn't really showing me what it's like to be an estate planning lawyer or a bankruptcy lawyer or any types of law, any type of lawyer, except for the for the uh, theoretical part. So what okay. I started to do is I was researching any type of lawyer throughout the U.S. that was willing to talk to me in all practices across the board, just to hear about their experiences and learn what their what it's like to be them as a lawyer. Were you and still studying or had were you done? I was still school? studying. Yep. I was okay. in my second year. So in the U.S., okay. three years of law school. So the first year is pretty brutal where it's really just focusing on classes. And then the second year, you can kind of explore more options. And so okay. and you have a little bit more free time, too. So a lot of people, they'll join groups in law school or they're volunteer. And so I did a little volunteering. I was part of some groups, but I had a lot of time to network. And so while I was networking, there was one smaller firm out in California, actually, and they had a, a specific uh, specialty in cryptocurrency, which I was interested in at the oh. time. And when I was chatting with him, he essentially said to me, hey, I'm a small firm. I don't have the overhead to bring someone on full time. Would you want to help me on a project basis? And this was in 2019, 2018. So the gig economy was like very, it was thriving with Uber and Postmates, right. which are the okay. delivery apps. Also, that idea of gig work really was in my head. And then I was like, hey, this could possibly be something in the legal industry because I've found this gap where law firms, especially on the smaller side, they don't have access, access to top talent and law students in general, they don't really have the opportunity to gain hands-on experience in multiple sectors of the law. They really can just explore wherever they're at an internship for the summer or the semester. So I found this niche and that's where the idea of gig law started, where it's essentially we provide law firms with legal intern level assistance on a virtual basis. And so this was right before the pandemic. So the idea of virtual assistance wasn't as uh, trusted. And then when the yeah. pandemic hit, it just was kind of the perfect runway to, to take mm -hmm. off. Do you think, at least in my experience, lawyers are very <laughs> against technology? Oh, yes. I, my, my previous startup was on the legal tech industry. Yep. And it was so hard. I mean, they're they're I don't know why, maybe it's the way they study, like you guys yeah. study in school, uh, but they're, they're just dangerous. technology averse. Yeah. Do you think what do you think about that? I mean, has that been a challenge or not anymore? So I think that the pandemic really changed the landscape in its entirety, because not yeah. only is technology now you have to use it, whether it's Zoom or it's DocuSign or PandaDoc, there are so many different platforms out there that you had to use in order to get the, the deals done in, this, in, in essence. And on the transactional side, I think people are more open to it. On the litigation yeah. side, it's it's still, you know, I think it's still more traditional. but. I just think lawyers are so risk averse that they mm -hmm. think, oh, technology, this is the way the, the our practice worked in the past. 
we're not going to change it. And the pandemic really upended that where now they have to change, they have to adapt. And also there are a lot of lawyers out there who are evaluating their decisions and maybe they don't want to work at a corporate firm and maybe they do want to just have a smaller firm or work at a smaller firm and have, and with a smaller firm, it's, you want to cut on costs. And so I think an easy way to cut on manual labor or just like human costs is to adopt technology. So I think right. there is a, going to be a major shift in the trend of adopting technology, but it's definitely, it started out as a major challenge, but I think things are changing for the better. And um, yeah, yeah, it's just, I think it's a generational thing because people in the younger generations are more open to adopting it, but the older generations are a little bit more hesitant. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, um, what do you think, what do you find these gaps? Like in my experience, people like do a summer summer job at a law firm or something. Is your concept, is your idea related to students don't get enough exposure to different types of law? And that's the goal of Geek Law for them to work at different uh, law firms, small law firms that do different kinds of things. And then they find their ideal type of law practice. Exactly. And so okay. I think the main reason is for that is, or my goal for that, or the thing that I realized while I was in law school is that you might go to law school thinking you want to do one type of thing, but you don't really know what you don't know. So for example, me in particular, I thought I wanted to do entertainment, but as I learned more about the laws, I had experience in entertainment, I really, I didn't know what else I wanted to do. So when I started to okay. get experience in bankruptcy and also estate planning, two parts of the law that I never imagined ever working in, I yeah. realized that I loved it so much. And then I started doing okay. it more and more and really was appreciating it. And, and I think that a lot of our students have that exact same type of experience. Yeah. So when a student comes on board, we always ask what they're interested in. And most of them will generally say general business law, IP, transactional. Then if I send them a unique type of assignment, maybe something on a litigation side or personal injury or bankruptcy, they end up really enjoying it. And then they start yeah. to reevaluate in their heads like, oh, maybe I would like this type of law. So, and a benefit as well as when the law students can connect with the law firms themselves and just see what their day-to-day -day lives are like. It just gives them exposure and more, more knowledge to make a more educated decision on what they want right. to do with their law degree. So for students to be part of Geek Law, it's just like a temporary I don't want to say solution, like temporary jobs, mm -hmm. very small jobs, right? That they can like shop around different types mm -hmm. of law firms, different types of law. And then at the end is the goal for them to find a, like a full-time job in a law firm and not spend any more time in Giglo. So their lifetime in Giglo is like short, a couple of years maybe, or even less. Yes. So that's okay. generally how it does work. However, what we've been finding is there's a lot of uniqueness and this might again be a product of the pandemic, but we have a lot of students who they came on with us when they were third year and then they graduated. They're recently licensed now and they either there might be a, a full time mom as well. So they just want to work part time. And so they came mm. to they come to us just for part time work. And then we also okay. have some students who enjoy having the freedom of just being able to choose assignments when they want be able to make right. a good income. And so a lot of we're finding that there actually are a few students who just enjoy working with us full time mm -hmm. on that independent contractor basis. So it's really dependent on the student and their situation and what their goals are and what their financial situation is. But um, generally it is throughout the lifetime of the of their law, time in law school. But we're also finding that some law firms they might enjoy working with a student so much that by the time they're graduating, they might want to bring on a, spe a specific student to their practice. So it can really set them right. up for a full-time job, which is great as well. We love that. Right. That's good. Yeah. How are you getting with this type of marketplace? Apps? I mean, in your case, it's not a true marketplace, but at the end, it kind of is because you have law firms on mm -hmm. one end and students and you do the matching. Yep. Um, so in general, the marketplace have a very hard time scaling because yeah. while it's very difficult for apps to get users in marketplaces, mm -hmm. it's even harder because it's times two, right? Absolutely. How do you get, I mean, we've been speaking about students. So how do you get students onboarded into Geeklo? Absolutely. So 
basically what uh, we did at the beginning was I started connecting with a lot of law school career centers just to tell them about what we're doing, what the what the opportunity can be for their students. And so then those career centers would go and post like a job posting saying, hey, you can do this. And I sent them a little blurb explaining what gig law is, how it's just a project basis app, or it can be ongoing if you get paired with a client. And once the law school career center started posting that, we just would get a hundred applications. So right now we actually have a wait list wow. of over a hundred students oh. waiting to come on board. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But um, this is where low code came in and was, is, you know, really changing the landscape of gig law because we would have so many students wanting work that the, the next challenge would be, okay, how do we get more clients? How do we get more right. law firms to send us more work? And then once we were growing the law firm side of the clientele, that's when it became an issue for me without having an app to manage it all. And so it was a marketplace, but like I was just the marketplace. So everything was just running through me, yeah. <laughs> doing manual emails, using Asana, using the tools that already exist okay. just to learn about what the processes need to be in place before I could build out an app. And also I just needed to prove the concept to myself that this is actually an idea that people on both sides want. But yes, it's- Are a, you doing this full time? <laughs> yes, full time. I have been doing this full time okay. since I graduated law school in May 2020. Uh, okay. Yeah. May 2020. Okay, cool. Now, okay. So, how do you get clients? Mm -hmm. So, just for context, um, law firms are law firms paying you and you pay the students, or law firms pay the students directly? They pay me and then I pay the students out. And okay. so basically okay. with, the, with the law students, we pay them on a biweekly basis and they now through the app that you built, um, they're able to submit invoices that way. But before I met with you, I had worked with Glide myself and created a very janky app for them to be able to submit invoices. And then for clients, the way it works for them, they're either on a subscription basis on a month to month basis or they're on okay. a project basis, but I keep their account open until the end of the month. And then at the end of the month, so on the first of each month, we send out the invoices to the client. So it's very, it's a very um, two-sided mm. process. Do you think that eventually when you onboard more clients, that will change? Because right now that part is still very manual. Mm -hmm. Very manual. Or do you think the business will go like more to a subscription-based model? or project-based or you'll keep both i think i'll keep both it really is just dependent on the type of client i think that so we have like different buckets of clients and so with general business lawyers and litigators they're more on the project basis but they might need 20 to 30 hours of work per month but they want to have that flexibility of saying hey, this month I only want to send 10 hours of work. So we keep them. I think okay. they prefer the project basis. But when you have a client who, like an estate planning client, they know, hey, I'm going to have eight plans per month. So they like having the set plan per month package. And so I think it just depends on the client. But we're going to keep both models for the foreseeable future just because it's, we're trying to meet the okay. needs of different types of law firms. And each different type of law firm, they're essentially a different type of customer profile. So we're trying to meet yeah, the needs of yeah. all of them. <laughs> and how are you getting customers? Are you doing like outreach, cold outreach, emailing? Yes. So basically what okay. we've gotten a lot of customers from word of mouth and referrals, which is great. So we haven't really invested mm -hmm. much money and we actually haven't spent any money on ads or keywords or anything like that. The only, uh, we do use a platform called Apollo.io. And so we build out the mm -hmm. list on Apollo, which gives you, it's great. It gives you access to emails and all that. And then we have sequences going for that. And so it's mainly email okay. campaigns and word of mouth referrals, but um, it really, it's, I would say it's 50-50 of where the clients come from on both of those. That's very good. I mean, when you have 50% of your clients coming from referrals, that is product market fits. Absolutely. Like there's, there's a very and they're happy. Meet. So I'm happy that they're happy. Yeah. So it's great. And uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are your clients saving money? Come, like if they didn't hire from Geek Law, what would they do? So there are different options that law firms can do. They can either have a student on board for the semester or the summer and give them school credit or not pay them at all. 
which okay. I, I, you okay. know, as someone who went through law school, I was offended by firms saying that they're not going to yeah. pay. <laughs> We're in our 20s. You know? yeah. yeah, you can't work for free anymore. I just think that model needs to go. Yeah. And then another alternative is that a law firm brings someone on for the semester. They can pay them a one-time fee or an hourly rate. Um, okay. I think that most, at least what I experienced personally, was that they paid me a flat rate for the for 10 weeks or for the summer. But then when you break down the amount of hours per week, it's still just um, for the students. It can it depends on how much they work, but it, it can it can either be fair or unfair. But um, for law firms yeah. themselves, I think the main way that they're saving costs is sometimes when they bring someone on for the summer and they're paying full hourly rates for the full weeks. There's probably a good amount of time per week, at least 10 hours, where the student's not really doing much. They don't have enough to give them. So by giving them the option okay. of a project basis, they're really only paying mm -hmm. for the work actually being done for them. And so that's great for them, too. Right. And then also another problem on the law firm side is the difficulty in actually finding talent. And so what our platform provides is that we actually vet our students. We give them training. And that's another uh, cost okay. for the firm is that they might put in if they have someone for a semester or for a summer they have to spend at least a week training them showing them their processes and everything and just making sure that all the work is up to their standards and with gig law we've created this what i call our our bible guidebook where it's essentially just everything okay. to make the best work product possible for our clients we put in in there and they have to follow it to a t for every type of assignment so whether it's drafting a contract, doing a research assignment, doing an estate plan, writing a blog post article. We have step-by-step -step instructions mm -hmm. for them. So we take away all of the heavy lifting of the training aspect and the finding the actual, the actual talent for the law firm. So we save them both monetarily costs, monetary costs, yeah. and then also time consuming costs and training costs. So it's all of these overhead costs that usually go in. That's where like we wipe it out for them. That's very cool. And since you have such a large database of students, you can qualify your students very much. So you can really have the best of the best on the platform. Yeah, exactly. Are law firms uh, working consistently with the same students or they don't care that much? It's so funny that you asked that because everyone asks me that and it's, it's completely random. You know, I think it's just completely based on what the law firm wants. Some law firms do not care okay. whatsoever. They just submit it and say, hey, anyone who wants to work on it, go for it. But I think once okay. someone works with a student and really likes their work, then they'll be really stuck on that student and say, I only want to work with this student. And so it, that definitely happens as well. But um, yeah, it really is mixed and it really it depends on the client. Okay, cool. So now I want to I talk about something else. So you came up with this idea mm -hmm. and then you started building the, the Glide app, the app in Glide yourself. How did you find Glide? How do you came up with the idea of, like, did you find Glide? Did you find no code? How do you end up in Glide? So I was part of a startup cohort where it was GigLaw and around seven or eight other startups that um, had access to these investors and advisors on a monthly basis that I was able to chat with. And there was one guy in particular that was just like a whiz with all apps. And when I was telling about the problems that I was facing, mainly just I was doing everything manually. I didn't automate anything. I, I don't know how to create an app. Like I was just kind of lost, just trying to figure out what to do. He was like, you need to find Glide, like go in there. If you're not technical, it's oh. fine. Go in and just build it yourself. And so I was like, oh, wow, this is great. Okay. Let me let me check it out. So I checked that out. And when I started, I mentioned I built out the invoicing part of my app and it was so hard. It's like, it's not that as easy as these people try to make it seem like it's great. I think it's okay. a lot easier than like bubble.io or some of the other right. platforms. Yeah. But um, I just, it took me at least 20 to 30 hours just to make my really not good app. And, um, but I saw the benefit and I saw the value. I saw the different templates that were available, but I realized okay. if I just bought a template, it might not meet the needs that I'm looking for. And so I found that's how I found Glide. But I found you guys by just honestly doing a Google search and just looking at like, what are the best companies to build out Glide apps? And you guys had amazing okay. reviews. I actually found you guys to have the most trusting reviews. And also based on the fact that you guys specialize in Glide, right? I believe so. That's what yes. I really like. Yes. 
there are a lot of other companies out there who are like, oh, we do Glide, we do um, App Sheets, we do Bubble.io, they do everything. And I was like, I, mm-hmm, I like mm-hmm. Glide, I want to work with Glide, so I wanted to work with people okay. who knew Glide. Okay. What do you, th- I mean, today there are a lot of automations going on in your app. Yeah. And I think that automations are really a game changer because it frees you up. I mean, you can do so many things that now the little bots are working for you. Yeah. Uh, so now that you have learned or seen how all of these automation works, uh, what else do you think can be automated down the road for Gigla? So I think like the, anything can be automated after saying what you guys can okay. do. I think um, the main thing I really want to, you guys actually have automated most of the things that are crucial for the business, which are mainly just the email automations, which I love. And then I just also, the main another thing I want to be able to do is, I don't know if this is automated though, but um, just being able to have um, law firms be able to actually tag students if they want to specifically only have one student on that. But I don't really know if that's okay. an automation. But my main goals for automation were one, the being able for the students to be notified when um, an app, when a, an assignment is posted. And then also right. the law firms getting notified as soon as someone accepts it. And then also when they submit the assignment and then when to rate and review the student. So everything that you guys did, like I really did spend the last year and a half just thinking about what needs to be automated. And that's okay. what went into V1 of the app. So I think as I test out the app more, we launched a couple of weeks ago and people are using it. It's been fantastic already, but I'm sure as we keep going, I'm going to get feedback from both the clients and the law students about what they want to be automated more. But right now it's, it's at a good launch place. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think this will go? I mean, what would be the goal to end up building a full blown platform that matches lawyers to, to students? Is that the end goal? Exactly. So I don't think it's necessarily matching. I think what I really love about the platform is that it's the platform is the central focus. It's not really just a marketplace for matching the marketplace for law firms to submit their assignments. And so I think what that's what I really love about it. And that's what's unique is that there's still um, a personal touch to it. From my end, mm-hmm, at least, mm-hmm. I know yeah. they can have us to reach out to if there's a problem. And then also, I think the personal touch of having the specific email to send the deliverable to outside of the app, maybe we I'll put that inside the app to make it even more centralized. But the long-term goal is build this out as much as possible in the legal space. And then I think there really is space okay. to grow into other industries as well. Like, I think the project-based market... Okay. In the in for students in general, it's really there's so much room for it, and so just um, just in the process of working with law firms, there's so many people that reach out for marketing needs and they reach out for accounting or bookkeeping needs. Like uh, I just think there's a lot of space outside of the law too to be able to build this out. But for okay. now, I'm definitely focusing on legal profession because that's what my area of expertise is and that's where uh yeah that's where i think it's going at least for the next year i have another question for a few or most of all of the features that you have in the current app are those features that you wanted them yourself or features that clients ask so it's my funny. question is did you a- added a lot of feedback from clients or was this your wish list like version one is your wish list maybe feedback is coming down the road. So Yeah. So it's funny that you mentioned this because a year and actually before May 2020, while I was still in law school, I had outsourced um, to some two engineers to build out a, a proof of concept for me an MVP. And I was so focused oh, okay. on, on an, on um, a progress bar. Like, you know, I don't know if you order pizza from Domino's ever, but they have a progress bar yeah. and that was my vision for it. And I really was like, Oh, this is going to be the central point of the app. And as I worked in the last year and a half, I like realized so quickly that was not even quickly, actually. I realized down the line, like, I don't know why I was so focused on that because that, that's what I wanted, but I didn't even take yeah. into consideration what the law firms wanted. And so everything that yeah. the app is built on right now is based on feedback from the law students and the law firms. And a major challenge was okay. figuring out how to put in all of their wants and needs on both sides. And like for the law firms, what I realized is 
they really, they don't want a progress bar, at least the ones that I work with. They want to see in like organized ways, like what's in, what's pending, what's in progress, what's completed. Like okay. they want to see that in kind of like a column-esque way, which is exactly mm-hmm. what you created. Mm-hmm. And so now they love that. And for the students, they love the same thing. Like their main number one thing that they wanted was to have a dashboard where they can just freely select. And then also um, just be able to stay organized on what's outstanding, what's completed, what they've completed. And um, the rating and reviews, that's actually something that the, it was more on the law firm side because they would always ask me, oh, how, who, who's working on my work? How do I know who they are? And so having the students create yeah, their okay. profiles, that was, it came out so much better than I could have envisioned because I just knew I wanted them to be able to create a profile. But the way that you guys built it, it's just like so logical. And I think... That's the main part of Glide and the app that you guys built is that it's just very logical and it's very logical based on the wish list that I created for you guys. But the wish list was completely based on learning from my clients for a year and a mm-hmm. half and learning from the law students for a year, for a year and a half. So I th- throughout the, the whole time that I didn't have an app, I kept saying to myself, I need to create an app. I need to create an app. But the question that I would always get back from people is like, what do you want the app for? What's it going to achieve? And that's when I really had to sit down and like figure out what the issues are in my current processes and how an app can fix that. And that's how, that's how I was able to um, put together that 20 point, 20 page PowerPoint I sent to you guys about the processes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's great. And yeah, I mean, with Glide, uh, we think, on, on user journeys, right? So it has to be very linear. So for yeah. students, they log in, they create their account. I mean, it has to be a very clear line because we are used to these million dollar apps like Uber and Netflix and whatever. Exactly. That you just open the app. I mean, a two year old can open Uber and they can order a car, <laughs> right? So yeah. it's, it's, it requires nothing from our end. So people expect that, that level of simplicity right. that when, while Glide is handling the user interface and the user experience, we just build like the flow and then you yep. end up with a good looking, great working app. That's great. Exactly. No, and that's, um, that's exactly cool. what you guys did. Do you think, are you planning to raise money or do you want to bootstrap this till the end? <laughs> I don't know if I want to bootstrap it till the end, but I definitely, for the first, like, Again, when I've spoken, because I I'm a big person of learn like learning from others who have achieved what you want to achieve, and so then that was like the million dollar question for me again for throughout the last year was whether or not I should raise. And so many okay. people told me the pros and cons of raising versus bootstrapping, and I think I think the main motivation behind me creating this company in and of itself was me realizing that I want freedom, like I'm willing to work 70 hours a week as long as it's for myself. You know, I don't, I don't like yeah. working for others and I like having the freedom that I do with the app, growing it, learning from it and not having the pressures that I think raising and um, having VCs involved and investors involved. So I think we're profitable right now. Every I'm um, putting all the money back into the business, just to invest and grow in it. And until I get to a point where I need to raise and I absolutely I need money in okay. order to grow the team or grow the grow anything, then I'm going to bootstrap until then. But, um, you know, I think I think the whole concept of being student based is what helps the company. It can grow. You know, I think that's where that's where we shine. What do you mean by that? So we operate and we're able to do grow and make money and do well and keep our costs low because the students do such good work. And I think students, okay. in law students, undergraduate students, any type of student, there's such um there it's like a pool of talent that's untapped because it's just such limited opportunity okay. because they think, okay, I'm a student, I go to one place, or they don't really, they might think on a project basis, yes, you know, the, the younger generation is very uh, crafty. But um, I think yeah. like for, for example, for sales development, we have a, a student intern on board and then for social media marketing where you have a student mm-hmm. intern on board. So I think giving these students the opportunity to have experience is what's helped, has helped us grow. And like having the students on board to do the work, that's what help, has helped us grow. So I think um, yeah. okay. we don't need to raise yet, but I'm sure down the line, yeah. if we really want to explode, there's going to have to be some sort of investment. But for now, I'm good with bootstrapping. That's good. That's great. That's a good answer. 
Uh, well, that's the answer I like. Anyway, <laughs> cool. So, Haley, uh, can you share with us where can people find more about Geek Law? Maybe your website or something. Of course, you can find us at giglaw.co. If you want to check out the app, you can go to app.giglaw.co. We're on base, uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. But the main places that we uh, post are on um, LinkedIn. So if you want to find us, you can look up me on LinkedIn or you can look up Giglaw on LinkedIn. But that's where we are. That's great. Haley, thanks for joining us today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me.